Welcome. This is July 17th Open ZFS Production User Call. We have Stu, Greg, Andrew, Jan, and myself, Michael. And Andrew, you get a gold star for putting your questions in the document in advance. What can you tell us about your first one? Well, they're not really quest questions for here. Um, I went into the Open ZFS Leadership meeting, which is a monthly meeting. Okay. And um, I went ahead and asked about why the channel programs don't support creating clones because that's been a recurrent question sure. here. And uh, Alan Jude said he doesn't think there is a reason. It's just kind of one of those things where when it was being developed, it wasn't something anybody thought to do because it didn't affect what they were working on. And he said they would be very open to a PR about it if someone wants to uh, hack on it at the uh, meetup thing or whatever. Uh, it should just take a, a bit of C and Lua. Well, that's remarkably straightforward and tangible. So maybe you'll stump us with the next one. You say Pavel came back with uh, Zvols along for a snapshot rather than a clone. Tell us more. Um, I'm not real clear on this, but I think it's... Uh... Yana said some things about this as well. That's why I wanted to note it. But the idea of something similar to a clone that it doesn't actually stay tied to the original snapshot. So you want to delete the snapshot? Okay, delete the snapshot. That's, that's that it's based just on. what ZFS Promote does. Well, change to child parent relationship or the origin relationship mm -hmm. between clone but and it doesn't have, clone. But you wouldn't have the uh, any of the promoting stuff going on. It would just be completely independent. Would, and it, so it's they, almost like block cloning for a Z-Vol? Is that what I'm hearing? Exact, exactly. Not just okay. almost like. That's exactly what, what he was talking about. Okay. I don't know how... I don't know how serious he is on this. Um, or if it's just discussion. He, Powell, so he proposed it, or mentioned? I missed the call. That the he was he was the one talking it about it. Okay. Um, cool. And the recording should there be should it? there should be a recording, uh, probably, if not today, probably tomorrow. I would expect. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't know exactly how far into it it was, but. So is this a big plus one for a topic he brought up? Um. This sounded similar to some of the stuff you were talking about, Jan. So I wanted to bring it to your attention that they were talking about mm -hmm. in that meeting. That that's why I put that one in there. So a block clone Zvol, okay. I could, could even be useful if you could do it uh, for ranges. So copy file range on the character device. That's uh, possible. You could, for example, d uh, up in from user space uh, a partition, or even just scan the file system for things you can offline dedup. Do you have a hard requirement for dedup, or it's just a, it's coincidental that the block cloning happens to make it? kind of work like that. I don't really have a use case for this. Uh, oh, right but Andrew does. <laughs> uh, and to answer your question, here is a link to the recording, and it looks like April is up. So if I get still recording, so I'll drop a link in the document also. OK. Sweet. Um, I need to go back through that because I'm not fully sure. I caught the, all of the, the stuff related to that. Um, so I wanted to go back over it. I was kind of dis distracted a little bit. OK, and I, I flat out missed the call such that um, let's all watch for that and note that you know uh, mm -hmm. there are often, it seems, low-hanging fruit opportunities for things that a developer would never consider by the user is like, hey, Ah, uh, please. <laughs> anyway, anything else relating to that? Um, 
Well, the one last thing was the, the, the question came up of, it's not on the call, it was in the document yeah. um, about, you know, are people using channel programs? And I said, you know, at least we got two people in, in this who are definitely using them for things. Mm -hmm. I, you know, Jan's using them and uh, uh, we've got, I know we've got some of the uh, snapshots. I can use them. them. You want to use to them. Use, I want to use them, but because you... I can't do everything I want in a channel program, um, they're kind of useless to me in their current form because just kind of batching the snapshot creation, that's useless because I don't have to create snapshots um, to me, but cloning would be useful. And yeah. Okay, I want to create snapshots at the end too, so I could save a little bit of time. With a few uh, more features, you would be using them. Given that, here's a list. What are we missing? Given that you would, uh, sorry, given that you were not, uh, kind enough to forward my um, ramblings, did, did you also bring up the idea of a ZFS ZPool streaming interface where you just write lines to a existing process instead of starting it every time you would just write a line uh based protocol of please do this command this command this command uh that no i that i forgot that sorry okay <laughs> nothing to be sorry for uh so during a lunch zfs boff section session at a bsd can years ago matt aaron's mapped out on a chalkboard some vision for that but it made absolutely no sense to me so it might be worth what of a streaming real-time replication thing for zfs but um so what i, I meant is not real-time replication it's, no okay there right. is a cost associated with starting with just running the ZFS or ZPool command. It's a not too small dynamically linked executable. It has to be open. It has to inspect the ZFS state. Uh, you see, send messages to the kernel, get messages back, constant switches, and so on. And uh, when you just want to do a bunch of very simple things, um, like querying a bunch of uh, properties or something, and for data transparency reasons, you can't use list because there could be a new line in there or something. Hmm. Um, so you have to run a lot of ZFS get, and that's slow. Yeah, and for but it a would lot be of... Sorry. If you had something where you just write a line and then get a line potentially with quoting inside of it back, or that would be a lot quicker, just less system calls, <laughs> no fork and exec. And do you think channel yeah, programs could I'm, do that, but you're not getting it? No, channel programs, as long as you can do everything you need in a channel program, you don't need it. Ah. But there are some things like, you still can't do like file system creation and so on, I think, mm -hmm. um, which is probably intentional, unlike the uh, clone version. So, um, yeah. Okay. Because well, what I would really like to do, uh, if I could with my channel program, is to basically give it as something Lua can understand, mm -hmm. um, the specification of which data sets should exist on behalf of a jail, potentially of all my jails. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to describe just a declaration of this should file should, um, should exist and it's just my persistent data. This one should exist, and it should be a clone of this origin. And then within a channel program, compare that to the reality, and as part of a single transaction, change it all. So if there's a clone from an out-of-date origin, just destroy the clone and recreate it by cloning again. Stuff like this. And then atomically, because a transaction is atomic, after all, that's why we call it a transaction. Right, exactly. Uh, your system would go from one state to the target state without ever user space being able to observe uh, an inconsistent state. Like, oh, I did part of the work. And, okay. Yeah. So then... Leaving out... Yeah, that um, 
leaving out any autonomy discussions, mm. um, the idea of having a the, the the stream interface, from my understanding of what you're saying, Jan, is basically this would be the kind of thing that a lot of times right now we would have to do using something like Xargs, except that only instead of using Xargs and having to restart the ZFS thing every item in the list. So right now, I can't do it with Xargs. Um, instead, I have to first do one thing, find out what the current state is. So by the loop over the file systems, then under the jail data set, then compare that to the specification and uh, compute the diff. And because in a channel program, you can run a few thousand or a hundred thousand or so uh, lower VM steps, that's enough, more than enough to compute the um, difference without having to go back and forth. So what I want is to have the, a tool which allows me to declare the target state um, of my jail or potentially more than one jail well, um, and so fast fix up the CFS uh, file system tree, oh, sorry, data set tree, that I can do it in on every jail start. So compare the state and if the diff is zero, it should be almost free to run. And if there is a diff, it should in a fraction of a second, fix that up. But doing it in multiple transactions means having to wait for a new transaction every time so it quickly can slow down. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Or yeah, did I lose everyone? Uh, programmable uh, housekeeping, but so we're missing what aspects of creation? The actual file system creation or clone creation or both? Um, which, what do we have? What are we missing? Uh, let me check on, I gave up when I saw that the clone creation is impossible. Um, because then. Let me right, it's a breaker for you. I totally get that. Um, me, about that. So let me check. Let yep. me check get what's this. And, uh, yep. Uh, so I would need a data set creation too, because I can't find it in the main page. That would be hilarious if it's there, but not document. Okay, create clone, create data sets. Create clones and and uh, file systems. Okay. Volumes so far I don't need, but potentially for Beehive uh, enabled jail set sure. uh, that would and, become relevant. Uh, uh, I, go ahead, Andrew. I'm like I, like I said, that. they yeah. seemed very, very receptive to pull requests mm -hmm. for it. So. Yeah, but ZFS as and the they name says the file system. Well, and they, from what from what Jude was saying, uh, from what Alan Jude was saying, it shouldn't be a super difficult change. Right. I think that's a, that seems if if the infrastructure is there, adding a few extra commands on top should one would hope not be too. Yeah, um, but it is file system kernel code, so you only get to make a mistake. Once that Correct. That, that's part of the course, of course. So it's not something I envision just tinkering with. Because uh, things like what locks must I hold or must I not hold when and so on. Oh. Even yeah. what thread am I scheduled to? Is there like yeah. a meta operation, worker thread, um, so that those are all neatly synchronized um, and serialized, or do I have to manually grab the locks and maybe even release others so that I don't deadlock? That's uh, why we have leaders and leadership calls, and we thank them. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, ZFS. That's also why we have VMs. Is the current manual page. Okay, man. Yeah, exactly. And and new now quiz from Rob Norris, which is a really cool like user space. VM to hack on DFS for Linux. Anyway, um, I, I will just make a quick note in the thing of like, hey, here is the 
manual page, which now that they've renamed them, which is good, uh, you have to find the name to move onward. Okay, memory limit, arguments, du, du, du. searching for create and uh, snapshot, 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 bookmark. Yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it. Um, yeah, good. Oh, so anything else relating to uh, the channel program wish list? Okay, let's talk auditing and uh, whatever other terms this might go by. Greg, you brought that up. It sounds like you're, you've had success with a proof of concept with a bare metal, bare upstream OS storage system. And the bean counters where someone said, wow, we have this checkbox for auditing and all these other competing products have it. And here's what we have. What you got? Um, yeah, that, that's basically it. So. Uh... Cumulo and Isilon are pretty much own the market in media and entertainment. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that, that that's attractive about them is this file system audit. And, um, and if, if I showed you, so I have a, a dedicated syslog server um, and it's just configured to send all the logs over to syslog and it's on that server where I do the parse into you know, just to log the transactions that we're interested in, such as deletes or moves, um, user IDs and whatnot. Um, so that they want uh, for forensics, because there's been a few studios, and you guys probably heard of some of them in the papers and whatnot, where Trusted people... Trusted partner... Network. TPN yeah. network, TPN? Yeah, yeah. yeah. TPN, yeah. Yeah, so so we have to be compliant with that, and one of the things is auditing. Um, so they want to know who did what and sure. uh, when um, on the file system. So that above there is just an example of what they look like. It's like uh, the IP of the node, then the UID, the protocol, which will be NFS or uh, or Windows, and then the file system operation. So that first line, you can see someone tried to create a directory where they weren't, uh, didn't have permission, and they got a denied error. Right. Yeah. Okay. Next one down, they made a file. Next one down, they deleted a file. So, so that's the kind of stuff that that uh, they need to uh, know about. And I didn't, uh, I I don't know how much impact it would be on performance. Like if this is something that can be monitored or if there's even any code or, or it's, uh, I did a quick Ooh. search for ZFS and audit and I didn't hit anything that I thought was relevant. Greg? Yep. On FreeBSD, uh, the functionality you're looking for is probably implemented one layer above in the virtual file system as part of the trusted BSD Mac framework. Uh, so you can probably get all the file system events you need via uh, audit D or audit this D. Okay, um, so so yeah, that would work. Um, are you so aware? Audit D is local, audit this D is uh, also the replication to a remote system so that you can store the audit records in an append only remote system. Yeah, yeah, that, that would work. Um, the unfortunate thing is, and um, I think I was attending, yeah, I was attending these meetings and I brought it up. Um, this ZFS, so we had a ZFS uh, uh, set up here that we used strictly for uh, near line uh, copies and it was off in our remote data center in case the building burnt down or whatever. Um, and then we bought another one when I came and I sort of like encouraged them to use it for a project. Anyway, the hardware that we purchased for that effort um, the FreeBSD version um, that I was using wouldn't install on it. It was having these uh, SAS errors and whatnot. It's, it's probably in these notes if you scroll back, but uh, sure, sure. yeah. Um, so I had installed a Linux one. So all that rambling was just to say, do you know, does, does right. that exist in Linux too? Well, so we've got Samba audit, which came up before the call, I believe full audit. And yes, it has a performance impact. Uh, thank you, Stu, for pointing that out. Is anyone using that in production now? I have I have a couple customers that are using it exclusively off host, just like you are for your syslog. Um, so 
rashly passing there... Samba into Syslog to then be Syslog and G to then be forwarded off those. That's not. Following. Is that catching NFS uh, audits too? Not likely by the name. That's the next sound, question. But... <laughs> yeah. It's not, but they're not using NFS. So again, it depends on what the use case is. The NFS side, you can put on an audit level log, as was mentioned, and pass it that that same path. Mm -hmm. The only thing that gets kind of funky is um, mapping of the user at the location if they are not consistent across servers. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. We, we we have that sorted out now. Okay, um, yeah, if you've got yeah. that sorted, that, that makes things a lot easier. Um, and then it's just a one-to-one -one mapping. I've actually had a, I built a wrapper God, eight, 10 years ago to do that static map um, as part of the syslog ng macro before it was forwarded on. So basically it's enriching the log before it got forwarded. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We we added an extra attribute in the in our LDAP. So no matter you could be coming in from Apple, Linux, Windows, whatever. Everyone has the same uh, UID and GID now, which is nice. Um. So I I guess uh, my question because uh, you know John and Michael and yourself sound developer uh, more more in tune with what the uh, code can do with ZFS. I was just wondering, is that something that, that anyone's considered implementing into the ZFS itself? Well, or would that always be a kernel kind of thing to deal with? That's exactly the question. Is that ZFS's problem or is that up the stack? It's what? The, to do any form of logging of the this logging we're describing, the auditing. Well, but I mean, t traditionally, ZFS doesn't have the concept of a file or a permission. Fundamentally, no. <laughs> so therefore, it can't, it cannot be at that layer. It has to be at whatever the virtual file system or the layer above it that's utilizing that storage to present it and say, based on my POSIX ACL, my whatever, this user tried to do this and succeeded, failed, or was told to bounce in. And if the higher level uh, denies an operation, the ZFS level, so for example, let's say someone tried to create a directory and didn't have the necessary permission, ZFS will never see that. Exactly. Right. It will. What happens is that probably the uh, path cache will contain, or main cache will contain the path uh, you try to create, then, oh, the VFS cache has a V node for that directory, uh, does the check on the parent, and the VFS says, uh, can't send. What, what is that? VFS is never called down into. What is that layer that is last aware of file names and paths before it mm -hmm. actually requests the uh, blocks? VFS? Virtual file system layer. Yeah, VFS is a common abbreviation. Every Unix-like operating system grew its yeah. own over time, yep. and they're all messy. <laughs> okay. Great. Speaking of that, Greg, can you get to NFS or to NFS four? Um, we so that's been attempted a few times, and okay. it, it had caused more problems than it. <laughs> brought that, that, uh, that does have some of those auditing features that are a little cleaner if i remember right mm -hmm. three I'd, yeah. have to I'd have to go back and look but that that's what's ringing a bell in the back in the dusty cobwebs in my brain yeah so, I, I was just gonna say that the, the last company i worked for before i came over here um was technicolor um i'm sure you probably heard of them of course um, yeah. no <laughs> and anyway, uh, yeah, sorry. Our, our Montreal office um, I, I tried to use NFS4, and we had 
I think 9,000 render nodes and 1,200 workstations use an NFS4. And within a year, they rolled back to three. And they had some really bright people working on it too. And it was just like, no, it's not ready yet. Yeah, for, for rendering it, for rendering it would be tough. Yeah. But how long ago was that? Um, I would say three years ago, four years ago. Because a lot of uh, issues with NFS four I've seen are just name ID mapping issues, which on Linux and FreeBSD you can disable, so that you basically put in the the name field instead of a real name, you put your decimal UID or GID in. Mm -hmm. So that it's uh, the name based IDs are. Yes, they are names, they just happen to be decimal uh, integers. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, the NFS4 has some nice things for sure, but uh, all. So I, I attend all these meetings and social events and. <laughs> Uh, my friend and I, well, mostly my friend, I just happened to be his roommate at the time, I uh, started this uh, thing called Studio Sysamins, and and all the Sysamins from like Pixar, Disney, Weta, like all all the studios from all over the world, we all exchange ideas there. Um, basically, my point is, is that there isn't anyone in media and entertainment still using NFS4 because it, it just keeps not working out for us. So That's that that may have changed, you know, things change every release but that that was the landscape as of a couple months ago oh months because ago especially for the workloads uh, you've described in past meetings things like parallel nfs would be a good fit if you have lots of medium-sized files accessed in the streaming like fashion mm -hmm. yeah I've, if you I've... could chart that over multiple backends you could scale out instead of up yeah, that, that, that really is interesting. The the thing though is, John, um we're we're a mixed environment, so we, we have to use uh, both Windows and Unix. Okay. And, yeah, and all the permissions have to be nice. That's what was nice about four is it, it could or NFS four at point one or two, whatever it is now. Um it can mm -hmm. do the extended attributes and whatnot. So you get like your Windows like granular yep. permissions, which is really nice. But Yes, proper yeah. NFS AC, or ACLs um, can help you with inherited per permissions mm -hmm. so that directories can have a permission template for files created in them and so on. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's really nice because you can say stuff like everyone in this group can access this file except for these two people kind of hmm. thing, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, okay. At that point, you're fixing a layer 8 problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry <laughs> to tell you that. The yeah. other thing, which for these kinds of things, I'm always tempted uh, to use in NFS v3 and use in my home NAS and so on, is uh, just interruptible soft mounts, which is a really nasty concept, but it's so nice. Uh, so, okay, the NAS is down, you get an IO error and return instead of, oh shit, everything hangs, what do I do? It yeah. degrades more useful, but it breaks, but in a clean way. So, yeah. Okay, so I'm doing a little bit of research, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of options on NFS auditing to syslog. I'm a bit surprised here. So Why would the NFS be have, special? It wouldn't be special, but if, yeah. you know, if you've identified that the vendors are toting it as a feature even if it's a transparent feature i guess we look elsewhere fine so yeah, okay I... on a, so you want to audit an nfs export on the server side yeah i, I think the proper way to phrase that would be to audit yeah. the file system because regardless of what it's served out via we, we still want to know <laughs> it's, it's the, the problem is that activity is what matters not what's present the right. problem with just auditing at the VFS level is that the VFS probably on an NFS server doesn't know the true identity. So it knows the user effective user and group IDs it should check against. It does not know the client credentials like its source IP address. That's like half a layer up. Hmm. And especially if you're using NFS v3 without Kerberos and so on, 
then at that level it doesn't you have lost the information of, of which client was it uh so yeah uh, hence, hence my macro development in syslog ng mm -hmm. to go and at that instant that it's logged who is there and where are they at so alternatively uh at least in it, it was a hack 100 percent. so lawyers or <laughs> previously you could use probably dtrace to extract that on linux ebpf trace but beware that ebpf trace by default doesn't warn you when you drop lock uh, events which in the case of audit events is not really uh, an option uh, hmm. dtrace warns you but it's still possible if you have uh, not enough memory because dtrace should not deadlock the system so it if there's no pre-allocated buffer space for the event these kinds of frameworks have to drop events and at least just increment the counter of dropped events. Interesting. Um, Andrew, does Alumos have some notion of uh, file system auditing, event auditing? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't. I haven't needed to dig down and do it yet. Event or I'm sure. I'm sure. At some point, some auditor will come and say, I need to, and I'll burn that bridge when I get to it. Fair enough. That, that's a good plan. Um, that TPN compliance is a, is a PETA. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'll, uh, I'll see if a uh, Cumulo uh, support guy that I talked to will, will shed some light on it because their systems are running uh, um, Debian with uh, Debian containers. So they somebody there has figured out how to do it and and apparently it doesn't impact performance uh, uh well um, everything does but you know right. not not much not brutally you know? yeah that's yeah. interesting okay yeah. whoa interesting link jan he found a d as uh, an oracle zfs audit files okay uh yeah uh, I'll just throw that in there. Thank you. So yeah, if you can buy that person a cup of coffee and just, I don't know, find out what they're using. Cause I doubt if they reinvented the wheel on that. Yeah. I could also just maybe go into the container to Docker container and poke around, see what I could figure out. But... Cough. Yeah. Well, I won't stop you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else that, on logging and auditing? Go ahead. No, I'm good. I'm good. I was just going to say that that would solve the Linux side of it, but not the uh, the free BSD ones that I'd prefer to be using. Yes, and again, things like Samba full audit is you know universal to Samba, but interesting. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Hey, thanks for bringing Samba that. Samba has its own VFS layer uh, for that. Oh, does it? Okay. Cool. Oh, it's private one. It just happens to you. Um, if they have something they call a virtual file system layer as well inside of SMBD. Got it. Uh, FYI. It's on VFS. Okay. So moving on. Uh, Jan, is this a broad developer question? Was, you know, what gzip and I'm guessing CPU hooks enabled in OpenZFS or you say fixed, was it indeed broken? So the problem I've found which people reported is that uh, if you have something like um, Xeon D with the chipset which contains a hardware deflate engine so that it can basically in hardware accelerate uh, gzip uh, and uh, compression and decompression yeah. is that yes it will compress to the your data to a valid uh, deflate but uh, the implementation differs from the software one so uh, it works as long as you only use that and the moment mm -hmm. you um, switch to a system which has either different hardware or other software, uh, it will say, tell you, no, check some error. 
Interesting. And so one could be burned by having gzip compressed data and then suddenly, oh, new well, hardware. And you have to have kernel support for day. uploading that. And because of that, I think it's not enabled, but it was in at least one test version. Interesting. Welcome, Daniel. So decompression is not dangerous because a valid deflated block always decompresses to the same data if you decompress it correctly. Yeah, but there are multiple valid encodings for the same data using gzip. Hmm. Uh, and that could be a problem. Um, which, so far as I know, right now on FreeBSD, uh, you can't use the deflate engine. But hey, it would be nice to have if you had hardware compression. Why not ask if it's usable in some way? Maybe at least for decompression. I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I don't have an answer. Uh, but Daniel, you rolled in the moment we got to root on 9P for use in VMs that have safer ZFS receives. Have you done any science since we spoke? Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't think 9P is going to help me there. The protocol is pretty... So I think I think that's the reason sort of why, you know, why uh, Vert.io FS and uh, Weasel FS exist is because there there are definitely some uh, there's some limitations just in 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 the nine P protocol. So yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that's going to help me with my with my dream, or or maybe my dream should just be to use a network interface because. <laughs> They're meant for shipping fast data anyway. Um, so yeah, yeah. So nine nine P isn't going to do me any favors with ZFS, I don't think. And I I, I did uh, I also experimented with the uh, with the serial with the VM. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, with, uh, I, I, know, I was I was I did I did uh, some base sixty four ZFS uh, sends over uh, what do you call it Vertio. Vertio console. Uh, oh, you so tell. I, I, it's, it's limited to a meg, a meg, uh, I think a megabit a, a megabyte a second. I think a megabyte a second. <laughs> okay. Not, not gonna, not gonna do me any favors either. But uh, yeah, I, I will one day discover the best way to do uh, to ship ship bits directly from a, um you know, from, from a host to a, to a VM and back, back again. Uh, but, but 9P is amazing for sharing. I love it. It's, it's great. I can't wait till it's, uh, you know, it's in release and I can put it on lots of my uh, boxes. I, are you, I mean, um, Michael, yeah. in your minutes, you mentioned VIT IOFS. That's yes, different sir. from, is that really VIT IOFS? Uh, or is that the name Juniper? It is not the misnamed one. Here's the repo, and I okay. reached out to Emil. Hopefully, he can join the call tomorrow. But so, yes, we're blurring the lines between ZFS and Beehive. But well, if you're using Beehive, you're typically using ZFS, and if you're using Jails and Zones, you're using ZFS. So all the things are all the things. So yes, this came up as of a bunch of research today and during the um, uh, Enterprise Working Group call. Oh, but you knew that you were on the call. Awesome. Anyway, let me fix this uh, URL. So, uh, Daniel, just enlighten us. It's like, hey, you uh, want to do a safer receive over the WAN. And I'm guessing, do we know how the uh, rsync.net of the world solve? I believe they have a ZFS uh uh, receive option, if I'm not mistaken, and like yeah, they must have. I mean, either they, they do. They, right. Do they so, do they put it in a Zvol or what do they? What um, or do they? Because they can't. Because like that is, I, I would I would say it's a, you know, Z, ZFS receive is is not what we would call. I mean, it's what we would call great in many ways. It's not what we would call smart. Um, and I, I think there, there, there are a number of well-published uh, security bugs uh, along the lines of, of using um, 
uh, resumes. You can you can decrypt things that were intended to be encrypted. Uh, you can do, you can probably create all kinds of different time bombs with it. So if you have an untrusted host, I mean, just like anything, just like just like any backup service, there should be there should be some extra uh, some extra protection. Um, for for the machine and and popping that into a VM with a you know with 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 its own mounted uh, ZFS is is one possible option. User land is another possible option. But but I do think that there are a number of applications for um, for you know for for transferring data between uh, you know between VMs on a on a sort of closed circuit. Mm-hmm. But but you know, host only networking isn't bad. I, I mean, I won't won't feel like a failure if I if I end up with that. But I was just sort of digging through every different thing that's called Vert, Vert IO to see if I could if I could do it. I guess I could do something crazy with PCI pass through. So, I don't know. Yeah, okay. going even deeper into Beehive only topics, uh, I still think it would be great if we have uh, IO V socks for Beehive. So it kind of guest yeah, to I guest would... or guest to host or host to guest networking with the host having a well-known ID and then you can have well-known port numbers on that or things yeah. like uh, replication. And it's basically um, because reasons they only specified datagram and stream, not sequential packet, but hey, you can work with that. And it would be really useful for things like get a ZFS notification and some for a baby stuff like the Q- QEMU uh, user agent can use it. Right. Okay. Because or, unlike yeah. an Ethernet interface, you don't have to uh, assign IP addresses to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Worry exactly. about MAC addresses. Worry about spoofing. I'll have more to yes. say tomorrow for sure on the oh. on the Beehive call. And okay. it's also the, in a way, the last red IO driver you ever need because you can proxy everything over Datagram and packet uh, and stream sockets if you have yeah. them. Yeah. So in a way, that be nice? everything else after that can be prototyped as a socket service. At the very oh. least, and for a lot of things, it would be very useful. For Just example, the file systems as well. Cool. And is there uh, established artwork on Vert.io vSOC? Uh, in Linux, yes. And also okay. Red Hat uh, undertaking in uh, cool. 2016. So it exists. It's not much used uh, from what I found. Got it. From a recent but... call, yes. Anyway, let's bring it up tomorrow on the Beehive call for those who celebrate and if there are regular attendees of this call who want to jump in, please, please, please jump in. So from a recent call, we talked about um, JSON output and I did some digging and I found that there is indeed a review that is perhaps near completion yet somehow is just not landed. So I asked around on the Slack channel for OpenZFS about what's going on there and hopefully that will arrive sooner than later and that is uh, pushing me to a theme for the user summit, which is, I do not have a good term for this, but what could slash should API management and reporting of ZFS look like? Um, Go ahead, Jan, you have an answer. One thing it shouldn't look I, like is- shouldn't. Wait, uh, no, it should. <laughs> Go ahead, I'll shut up. One thing it shouldn't look like is uh, top saturated fields on a line because it's just not um, universal. Hmm. As in uh, values can contain tops and new lines and then you are in quoting her because hmm. uh, several VFS features, for example, ZFS list and so on normally don't quote things like ZFS list uh, don't even offer that. So you have to do a ZFS get for every uh, discovered data set and property, for example if the property value could contain the separator. So that just 
while not pretty, just adding JSON support would probably be the most useful. Things um, like things like nmap use greppable as an output. You know that it's the same thing. If it's in JSON, it doesn't matter because the structure is already built for you, and mm -hmm. the white mm -hmm. space management is controlled. But, but yeah, you know, there are lots of lots of different tools have dot different. The problem is that I'm finished. You I'm can't finished. fix up a corrupted stream if you have no data transparency and don't know and can be desynchronized. Hmm. If you do a ZFS list uh, and the user property contains a new line, good luck. Yeah. Right. You could inject the arbitrary lines into the parser. Or we restrict that so it can never happen, but you know, that would be. Then other things break <laughs> because people want to st have already stored multi-line strings in ZFS user properties. Oh, and the joke so goes. What do you like, do? Uh, like tab an import, tab check the pool down. and panic? Uh, if you find this, no, sorry, it's too late. Hmm. Okay. What beyond net uh, netmap has an example of what's a more user friendly output? Um, and map already has an XML output format, I think, as well, just not okay. just. Yeah, it's okay. just there's five or six you know different options for nmap. That was just the one that sure. has a. It's literally called greppable. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. Um, other examples of what we have seen elsewhere and would love to see in ZFS to make it actionable. Uh, the more tangible this notion yes, is, the more we there, can. There yeah. is something I've which Linux has, but FreeBSD doesn't, and as far as I know, Solaris also does. Yeah. And that is a problem if you want to have multiple um, Jails uh, instantiated as clones from a parent, even if a clone is read only, or especially when you have a problem that um, you can't reown uh, all the files in the clone without modifying all the metadata, which is a bit slow. And then it's no longer a unmodified clone, but now you have a few megabytes at least of diff. Uh, materialized and it's slow to do so you can no longer for free replace the clone so it would hmm. be really nice if ZFS had an option to uh, is the, apply a bias to a group and user IDs on sort a property to just say hey uh, uh, basically, or even better a range so that you can say all user IDs in this data set must be within this range and then add this offset. Hmm. From an auditing perspective or from a... No, not from an auditing, but for, so oh. that you don't have to store the, the per jail or uh, UID and GID ranges you're using in the clone. Hmm. So Linux does that at the kernel level, a few levels higher, but with your uh, user ID mapping and group ID mapping, VSC groups, but yeah. Cool. Uh, and on that theme, I found- But what they do is guy. they do the reverse uh, translation. So uh, they kind of suffice us to report the original data and then the, uh, the container mechanisms in Linux map that. Whereas I would like to see it the other way around. Yes. <laughs> Cool. I found some API examples following this broader theme. And just thinking themes for the user summit, uh, there are various GUI-like tools, starting with the original Solaris time slider. But welcome, V. Do you have comments, questions, ideas, or thoughts, or topics? V is still connecting to audio. So oh, yeah. V's got a big didn't hear you. video. Good point. Let's see. Although a microphone and speaker output might be very different thing, but we will give them a moment. Connecting to audio probably is stuck at the <laughs> window for it. Please pick your audio device. Oh boy. Yep. 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 Cool. So we'll give you a moment. Um. Let's see. Uh. I guess hot topic on my head is the uh, user summit. I need to get my butt in gear on that. Any ideas, requests? session ideas because I think I'm I'm trying what I tried to do with the 
sort of API and reporting is like find broad topics we can do a workshop on and say, okay, here's what we have. Here's where we want to be. Things like the uh, like the missing channel program functionality is pretty tangible. And the more we can explain it and give use cases and even you know, dummy syntax, well, that's uh, motivating. And maybe that means people raise money. Who knows? Anyway, uh, V, do you have audio? I, uh, v, can you hear us? Okay. Oh, uh, Steve N, welcome. Any Hot topics, questions, you name it. Uh, just listening in today. I, I do think that concept of money is starting to hit home with me as far as <clears throat> we were talking last time about um, do we think Windows users, you know, like as a community, do we want, you know, do we want to extend into this? Area? And then I realized later, I'm like, oh, actually, it's, a product has to exist that generates money to pull, <laughs> to pull development that way. Uh, uh, yes, I, a bunch of us are aggressively open source folks such that, well, we make our monies in different ways, not just the code and such as life. Uh, users, and I'll try to phrase this, users without a product. Um, so yeah. Uh, if I can type, uh, ba, ba, ba. Think of the co-branded co -branded press cockpit. You know, a lot of, a lot of topic and a lot of discussion. Uh, did you mention cockpit as in the Red Hat thing, or a, did I miss as, it? As in the window Windows, we will watch you forever. Oh yes, the the oh boy. Uh, Sorry. Yes. I digress. No, no, it's good. We we hopefully have like t-shirt topics coming out of all this. Um a show of hands, who thinks they can make it to the user summit in October, which is scheduled for what? 16th, 19th-ish. I have it down as actually 26th through 29th. Oh, and you use little hands. Cool. Very nice. <laughs> Welcome, Steve. And Stu, you're like 20 minutes. Yeah, I gotta away. find I gotta find my hand button. Yeah, okay, cool, cool, cool. Super yeah. good to know. Uh then to some degree you might be anointed part of the organizing team, and you've already already mentioned that, and I appreciate that. What days did you say that was? That is the 26th and 27th of October for user content, 28th and 29th for tradition, Monday, Tuesday for developer content. Okay, I I don't know yet, but it's looking like my plans are falling apart. So I may just slide my days off o over a week. Cool. Who knows? Cool. There's always that. Well, cool. Then it depends uh, on how much of a how much of a lead time I need to give y'all. Probably. Those dates are there. I just need to get my so my behind in gear. Uh, anyway. Uh, but very much from a content perspective, I welcome your input about how do we make time together face-to-face, -to -face, possibly with hardware, some of which I can drag over. How do we make that just super valuable and have a seamless handoff to the developer saying, hey, it would be really great to have this and maybe here are a few shuckles and off we go. And you've reminded me, Stu, any news on your multi-actuator drives? Unfortunately, I have not done anything really significant on testing. Um, we had a minor air conditioning issue, so I had to shut that server down for a while. Cool. Uh, looks like V had technical difficulties and has vanished, but uh, maybe we'll see them soon. Okay, gang, anything else at this time? I have a I have a lazy, I have a lazy question that I could probably yeah, Google, but I'm going to ask it because I have a lot of brains in front of me. Um, okay. I was talking to Alan about storing uh, metadata, metadata comments in individual V devs. Is that is that just the Z pull uh, set comment command, or is there something brewing that that he's referring to? There is what a kind of comment. comment? 
What? <laughs> you could set some sort of custom custom property on a VDEV itself. So then you could, you know, have have a backup of, you know, like serial number and other useful maintenance type information uh, in the in the each in each individual VDEV rather than the the pool itself or the data sets. So that could, you know, that could have some maintenance uh, and monitoring usages. Mm-hmm. Um, um, anyway, he mentioned it, and then I was looking for it. I saw a vpool set uh, comment, uh, which, but that, but that seems to be for the whole pool, not for vdev. It is um, as of OpenCFS two dot two, the uh, per vdev properties, as far as I know, haven't landed yet. The idea ah, is that okay. you can have a now that you now have read writable properties not just for pools and data sets but also for VDEVs. And one of the most requested uses for that, that as far as I understand, motivated uh, Alan's work on that feature is ah. the ability to specify uh, things like the queue depth and, and uh, schedule information per VDEV so that you can have on a hybrid pool, let's say you want to have want to schedule up to uh, 20 reads to your uh, SATA spinning disks, but to your NVMe drive, you don't mind a QDAP of 200. Instead, you want it to get way over 20 so that you can keep the drive busy between interrupts. Um, nice. So right now, the problem is that uh, you have a few SUSCDLs on BSD and think and Linux it's in the SUSFS, um, but those are global. So yep. if you have, and no not even per pool right now. So even if you have the split pool, one for flash and one for um, spinning rust, you uh, are forced to find a trade-off which isn't too terrible for either, or to accept that uh, latency on the spinning disks is going to uh, suck, or that you are losing throughput on the uh, flash. Hmm. because the queues run empty all the time or the other way the queues are so long that you have 10 milliseconds for a random read times QDAP so you have three seconds of worst case latency for a read because there's so many things queued before it but if you're instead of 10 milliseconds you have 50 microseconds or so I owe a read latency then that wouldn't be a problem that QDAP so yeah, Very interesting. for a parental duty. Do you want to continue for a bit or call it good? And I would love to see that uh, hit, hit OpenZFS. Okay. As far as I know, it's not done. Got it. Well, let's call it good there. I hope some of you can reach out on the Beehive call tomorrow and I wish you a fantastic remainder of the day. I will leave this open for a little bit. And Jan, do you want the honors? No problem. Just like and subscribe. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. Have a good day. Better off.